Thank you for joining I Am Possible, which is India's first future tech meets sustainability podcast. Today, I'm delighted and honored to have with me Nirosha Murugan, who is an assistant professor at Algoma University and an interdisciplinary scientist. So, Nirosha, really appreciate you taking time and being part of our show. So, why don't we start with a brief introduction? Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for having me, and I'm excited to share all the exciting work that we do in our lab. And I'm an assistant professor at Algoma University. My interests lie in understanding how people communicate with each other and their environment to kind of understand how they communicate to create tissues and organs and complex systems. So that's the overarching interest in uh, my lab and what I'm interested in. And the specific aspect is kind of harnessing the biophysical signaling. So we're pretty familiar that cells use molecules, molecules and genetics to kind of program their fates. Uh, there's exciting new work that's being done right now to actually show that biophysical signaling from bioelectrics, bioelectromagnetism, biomechanics, all of those can be harnessed to change the fate of cells and change the language within cellular programming. Would you like to unpack what biophysics is? Absolutely. So biophysics is kind of just the blend of physical principles with biological organisms. So we kind of use the principles that we know in physics, for example, electri electricity, electromagnetics, mechanics itself, in understanding bi biological organisms, how they function and the structures around them. Lovely. How cool is that? And I, I think Michael Levin and his lab, they're doing something really, really cool with uh, electro bioelectricity. bioelectricity. Yeah. yeah. So, so we'll get into that. And, and, and obviously, I mean, I got in touch with you because, you know, the the last couple of weeks, there was this news all around the world, crazy news. Then that there's this lab and Nirosha Murugan partnering with Michael Levin has kind of created regenerated a uh, frog's leg. So, so we'll get into that. But before we get into that, why don't you talk about your lab? You know, because you mentioned that your expertise lies in neuroscience, cancer biology, regenerative medicine, ele and electromagnetic medicine. Why don't we just break it down one thing at a time? Start with cancer biology. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think they actually go quite together. The, the overarching theme of, of my lab, and I've been trained by, you know, some great people in the field, pioneers, Mike Levin, David Kaplan, and, and Michael Persinger. And the thread throughout that, that lineage and that training was to see how cells essentially communicate with each other. And that kind of goes into cancer biology, you know, where cells, they right the wrong and they proliferate uncontrollably. And that's essentially what cancer is. And in regenerative medicine, where we have stem cells that have infinite plasticity, infinite potential to become whatever cell that they want. And then in neuroscience, where we actually do understand the electrical signaling within neurons. So, you know, if you take all those pieces together, what my interest is, see how those different systems communicate with each other to get growth and form and function uh, within a biological organism. And, you know, I'm taking kind of a, a more narrow approach right now and focusing on specifically bioelectrics and uh, bioelectric magnetics to see how those cells communicate in all of these different uh, mechanisms or fields to, you know, right the wrong or create new functional uh, systems right so so would you also like to unpack bioelectric and bioelectric medicine what does it actually mean and what does it actually do right so uh bioelectrics is kind of playing on the idea of the membrane potential so all cells are electric based on their ionic flow across that cell membrane so just by maintaining certain membrane potential around that cell membrane you create a um, electric field. And so by exogenous applications, so from outside in or inside out, the cells are responsive to changes in this uh, electric field. And we're seeing that just from internal changes or uh, environmental changes that you could actually play with or you know harness cellular potential that way. And electromagnetics is kind of the same thing with electricity follows mag magnetism. So um, there's a ton of literature that's been done to show that magnetic fields do have on biological organisms, not just humans, but also in wildlife. Um, some animals are more receptive to these magnetic fields um, than humans are, and they have structures and functions related to that. And so that's um, that was really fascinating to me, is that we have uh, all of these electrical systems in our environment and magnetic systems in environment. How do biological organisms kind of interact 
uh, with those physical uh, forces. Right. So, so does this kind of surprise you? You know, this bioelectric because you know we've got trillions of cells in a body. It functions because of electricity, and and. and I think a brain does something similar, you know, there, there's around 80 billion neurons, 100 trillion synapses, and it fires because of these uh, electron signals uh, firing. Are we mechanical in nature some, somewhere? I mean, do you kind of question that? Yeah, I mean, that's kind of where the basis of my interest came from, is that if we know that the brain and the heart are electrical organs. We know that they use these changes in the ion potential to um, communicate. So there must be other forces that cells can use to communicate with each other. As I was saying, you know, whenever you do have electricity, it's just like a wire. The neuron is essentially a wire. Uh, when you have electrons flowing through that axon, there must be some sort of magnetic potential, magnetic force around that. And, you know, the, we have technology now like the squid that can pick up ultra weak magnetic fields. Um, and we're trying to understand more neural communication with these other forces outside of electricity. And, you know, that begs the question, you know, if the neuron can do it, can other biological cells do it as well? And do we have the technology to, to listen and to see what those cells are doing and listen or saying? Right. Yeah, yeah. How cool. We're getting into a world where we are understanding who we are. I mean, you know, what we are made out of, how we function. And I think the more deeper we get, we, we'll get deeper questions. But those deeper questions could raise some serious moral and ethical I implications also. Uh, you didn't touch the subject of electromagnetic me medicine. Would you like to shine light on? Yeah, um, so the electromagnetic field in, the, in terms of the, the biological aspect, there are techniques out there where they actually use exogenous application of uh, electromagnetic fields to solve you know, biomedical challenges. Um, for example, bone regeneration, there's a lot of literature to show that, you know, magnetic coils can be used to facilitate bone regrowth in animals that, you know, have lost a uh, bone or after an injury. So we're using applied, very appropriately patterned magnetic fields to solve challenges in medicine. And usually it's some in sort of tissue injury, we're using them also in skin regeneration as well in humans. So uh, we're making progress. And I think the, the lack that we have in electromagnetic medicine, which is just utilizing this physical force to solve medical challenges, is from actually understanding how is it the magnetic field is interacting with the cells. So I think we have that gap. And I think you know, understanding bioelectricity a little bit more. How does the electric language play in cells will help us understand how the magnetic language will interact with cells as well. Right. Would you like to share your research work on cancer biology? Yeah, absolutely. So this was uh, um, what got me interested in all of this in my uh, PhD and my graduate work, again, with cellular communication. Um, and what we did as a team in the, in the Persinger lab was develop a technology the, that could communicate with cells in a very timed and spatially controlled way. Um, and what we found is that we could actually change um, the flow of calcium ions within the cell. And, you know, when we change, we know that calcium ion has all sorts of biomolecular impact in the cell. It, it controls their growth, it controls their death. And so by just fine tuning that language, we can change um, the uh, cancer's fate, and we actually can actually stop the growth of cancer. And so that kind of built on, and that's what we did in my in my PhD, was to develop other signals and language that we can communicate with cells to stop the growth of cancer in dishes, in, in plates, in vivo, and in vitro as well. When does this come to fruition? When does this come go out of lab to actual, you know, the healthcare use? Um, that's a great question. You know, there are companies out there right now out in Seattle that are, are doing this um, with uh, brain cancer. Uh, like, for example, Novacure, they have these weak electromagnetic fields that's actually being used in clinic right now as an alternative approach to cancer therapy um, for brain cancer. So we are seeing some of this uh, technology being used right now. Um, there's more development that need, needs to be done to kind of target all the different kinds of cancers um, because no two cancers are the same. No two, uh, how 
patients experience those uh, cancer effects are not the same. So we need to know, understand the biology a little bit more and, and quite frankly, also improve our technology of how that magnetic field will interact with the cells. Well, you know, with all this progress that we have in nanomedicine, um, that is actually great progress that we're making to kind of deliver this magnetic field right to the cancer, for example. And um, yeah, so we are seeing it right now in clinics um, all over the world. Um, but more progress, obviously, uh, can be made. Besides nanomedicine, what are the other innovations or the technology coming together you think will accelerate cancer therapy that you're talking about? Yeah, I mean, you know, these um, advancements that we're making in biomedical engineering, you know, devices that are biocompatible that can, you know, stay with, you know, I, you know, it's an interesting question because in medicine, there's a, this push towards, you know, personalized medicine where we're kind of creating treatments that are focused to each individual at a time. And, you know, creating devices and compounds and drug therapies for each individual person means that you need to have advancements in biomedical engineering that can be tailored, that can be modified on the fly. Um, so I think, you know, progress that we're making in, in technology that way. And I also think, you know, AI is playing a really important role in understanding how um, signals and interaction effects occur as well. So sort of like on the go treatment, um, as the cells are changing, can we use that to kind of predict how the magnetic fields change, how the electric fields change as well. So, you know, the cancer biology, cancer itself is a difficult uh, challenge. And I think having these big interdisciplinary approaches is probably our way to you know combating this problem right exactly i th i really i mean double that because i think you know even if you see uh, with the this field of technology i think everything is converging you know and there's no one single technology you know right now uh, ar vr is converging with uh, iot blockchain and, and ai and and that's when it's adding real world value so yes i mean these interdisciplinary approaches i think will play a huge role in, in creating some serious transformation in the space of healthcare regenerative Absolutely. medicine you yeah. are be being in the news for uh, <laughs> regenerate uh, regenerating a frogs like would you like to talk about that yeah i'm very very excited that um this work came out and it, we had a generally positive um, reception to this and this is a work that's a collaborative project as we just kind of just talking about it's an interdisciplinary approach where, the, where we bridge you know, uh, devices that stemmed from biomedical engineering uh, principles and what we know about regenerative biology. And um, I have to thank the entire team for, for what, it, what we have done so far. So yeah, I'm happy to talk about that project. Essentially what we wanted to do was create um, a way to interact with the tissue, not micromanaging each molecular process. So you can imagine that after a big injury like limb amputation, that all sorts of molecular signals are going haywire. And it's really hard to kind of control and micromanage all of that. So what we what we um, developed was a, a technology where we can apply chemical signals, sort of like a top-down approach to um, kickstart regeneration in an organism that can't um, and let the system kind of take control to facilitate that regeneration over that regenerative period. For In our case, it was 18 months. Right. Would you like to unpack that those chemical signals? What do you actually mean by that? Yeah. So in our study, what we delivered were five uh, key compounds that we wanted, where each of them had a particular effect within the tissue. So, for example, there was a compound uh, BDNF, which stands for a brain derived neurotrophic factor. And this uh, protein we know actually very well in the literature helps nerve regrow or helps nerve grow in embryonic development. So we thought, hey, you know, after an injury, if we want the nerves to regrow back, if we apply that same compound that's there in normal development, that should, you know, push the system towards regenerating the nerve tissue. And that's exactly kind of what we found. So each of those compounds, like BDNF was for um, nerve, the growth hormone, which helped the uh, bone regenerate and help cells grow in a, the, the cell cycle grow in a um, uh, specific manner. So each of those compounds had a specific effect from a biological perspective. Right, so this frog that you used for the experiment, uh, 
did the entire limb grow back i mean how, how, would you like to talk a little bit more about that yeah absolutely so we didn't get the perfect limb it, it wasn't the exact same limb that the animal uh, had prior to amputation but we are have made advancements in the complexity of the limb so frogs after especially adult frogs after their metamorphosis after their development uh, af- when you have an anti- uh, when they experience a hind limb amputation what they will regrow back is a amorphic spike so it's just a soft tissue with that doesn't have any nerves that doesn't have any blood vessels just very little cartilage inside of it and so we've enhanced that a little bit by facilitating more nerve growth more bone growth and complexity in the shape of the uh, that new limb that is similar quite similar to the uh, original limb now um, I, I say it's not perfect because we are still missing critical structures like the webbing that helps the animal uh, swim better and and nails or their claws at the end of their feet uh, but I think this is a significant advancement just by a single, and the important thing here is just a single application of the drug treatment. Right. What does this mean for humans, you know, who have been amputated? I mean, would would this be, what timelines would you kind of give for it from moving to a frog to a human? I mean, that's the million dollar question, isn't it? <laughs> um, you know, it's hard to say. Uh you know, if we're trying to be optimistic, I would love to say that it's in our lifetime that we'll get there. But I think we've made enough enough of an advancement right now where we as a community can kind of build off of this to say, OK, if this is what one treatment can do uh, with this new application system by applying, um, you know, silk deliver silk based delivery of drugs. Um, what does that mean for, you know, compound delivery for multiple deliveries? Um, so I think, you know, this is an advancement and we are the Dr. Levin and Dr. Kaplan are working towards, you know, mammalian effects. So I think we're making progress. It's hard to say what the timeline is, but uh, I'm hopeful that uh, we're going to make uh, significant advancements. You know, nature does this in a very, very beautiful way. You know, there's lizards and salamanders. They, they do that. Is there any way that those learnings could actually apply over here and maybe it could kind of accelerate your research? Yeah, I mean, the regenerative community has been doing exactly that, you know, learning from these master regenerators like axolotls, for example, you know, they have uh, a population of stem cells that allow them to regenerate. Uh, So we are learning from, you know, how do we stop that? The Dr. Jessica Witted's lab um, is doing exactly how do we stop master regenerators from regenerating? So maybe we can learn from if we can control how to stop it, maybe then we can learn how to start that process in organisms that can't. So all of these beautiful questions are uh, being explored uh, as a community in the regenerative field. So um, yeah, every model system that we use actually adds more to the story on how to regenerate one day in humans. Right. So for the last possibly a couple of months, because I mean, that's when I kind of discovered Michael Levin, I, I'm just in awe of what he's been doing and he seems to be everywhere, you know, right from his, this bioelectric and regenerating planarians and stuff like that. I mean, how is it working under, I mean, you know, working together? I mean. Oh, yeah, fantastic question. You know, I, re- I was really excited when he um, brought me on to his team as a postdoctoral fellow because I, we share a lot of the vision in terms of thinking outside of the box a little bit, you know, still bringing in um, foundational principles in biology and, and um, all of these, you know, peripheral fields. But I think he's a, he's a, he's a great mentor uh, who understands, you know, the big picture and, you know, is willing to, is willing to take the, the question a little bit step further and bring in other d- interdisciplinary fields to, to answer, you know, big challenging questions. So, yeah, it's, it's been an amazing experience to be uh, mentored under him besides michael levin are there any you mentioned a couple of labs uh, besides michael levin are there any other labs or uh, cutting edge innovation in the space space of regenerative medicine that's caught your attention absolutely i mean this project uh, could not have been possible without david uh, dr david kaplan uh he's one of the the leading biomedical engineers especially with silk based devices and he was the pioneer who actually developed this device um, along with his uh, graduate student, Annie Golding. Uh, 
Um, and Dr. David Kaplan, there's not enough words to say how brilliant he is in his own field as well. So, you know, as a, as a junior scientist who's learning from these just amazing uh, people and how they think is actually what's inspired me to kind of continue in my own way, in my own lab, um, you know, just doing the good science in the appropriate way, but also being able to kind of think outside of the box and see how the little puzzle pieces connect uh, has been absolutely helpful. I'm super excited because, you know, every month or so, there's some insane acceleration happening in the space of technology. And it's taking us one step forward, you know, and maybe one step two steps behind also because this this growth of technology i mean you know it's in, in everything from genetic editing to artificial intelligence to the metaverse to it, it's so very exciting but at the same time it, it, it's a little scary also so is there anything around this space that kind of worries you hmm, that's a great question um particularly with the work that we've published not Exactly. I think, you know, we've, we're, we're doing the science in such a way that it's sort of, you know, step by step, or looking at what we're doing with a single application, the next step would be what will be multiple applications. So I think from a, from the science, not really. But I, I do, I do see what you're saying that, you know, with all of this advancements in all these different fields, it would be, um, you know, it would, I would want to take a little step back to see what would happen happen if you just were truly into this and put everything together all at once um so that would be a little bit concerning and so that's why you know these systematic experiments these systematic studies are are crucial to kind of alleviating that some of that concern yuval noir he puts it in in a very beautiful way in his book homo deus you know he says that we are moving from being homo sapiens to homo deus because in the next maybe decade or so you know we'll have godlike powers because this technology is kind of enabling us and empowering us you know and how we kind of choose to use it is where it is how we will be able to kind of shape the future of a world, whether it's in a good space or, or, or a bad space. Uh, when do you move from frogs to do you try and uh, is there a, like a chart roadmap from frog to like another animal in human trials? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so uh, typically you would want to try in smaller mammals that are similar, to, um, much more similar to, to humans. And th that those studies are being done currently right now in the Kaplan and Levin lab. Uh, collaboratively. So, you know, as I was saying, you know, the road towards uh, clinical use is, you know, is, is clear. Uh, it's just, you know, a matter of time and a matter of systematic studies to, to make sure that that we are on the right track and we're making the appropriate modifications to to uh, accelerate the progress. Nirusha, thank you once again for being part of the podcast and I'm full of pride because I'm speaking to an Indian, you know, someone who's playing such a crucial role in possibly maybe in the next few decades where we humans could be able to regenerate our limbs. What's your your moonshot or vision? Uh, personally, my vision would be to get to a, a place where we are truly interdisciplinary where we um, are willing to explore ideas uh, in a very, you know, again, systematic way. And, you know, personally, from a scientific perspective, I personally would like to get to a point where we actually truly understand cellular communication and how the cells um, and our biological systems interact with our environment. Um, I think if we have that, and it's, it's a very blue sky idea, if we have a really clear map of that, I think we can write all sorts of diseases back into their healthy state and create, you know, this super organism. Um, that would be the, the the dream, but, you know, again, only time will tell. Lovely. Wish you and, and the team the very best, Nirosha. I really appreciate you taking time being part of the podcast. And to my listeners, if you like what you see in here, then please press the subscribe button. Until next time, see you guys. Thank you, Nirosha. I really Thank appreciate you. this. Thank you. <laughs>